slide? That's good. Well, no. Go back? Go back to. Uh, okay, that's good enough. Okay. <clears throat> and now back to me. <laughs> that's, that's something that we uh, picked up from our son. And we've used it a lot in fun. But I do want to say one thing that <clears throat> concerns my presence here. Last July 31st, I had a mini stroke and, and uh, I spent the night in the hospital. As far as I could tell, the only thing that was affected was my legs. And so they are, they're in bad shape now. But um, I knew that once you had a stroke, there's always a possibility of another. Once you have a mini stroke, there's a possibility of many strokes. And so I spent a lot of time uh, asking God in the last several months to just let me go to York let me do this because this is one of the one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life. Um, that's not good grammar, but I only taught English at one college for two years. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is it. Final final episode. I was talking about the, the church in the 1960s and, and the, the move toward entertainment and the fact that many congregations or I've heard of, of several that have uh, given in to the idea of entertainment and have moved so far in that way that, that they are actually uh, giving up what the Bible teaches about several things, many things, including what Jesus said about being saved. Uh, but in the 1960s, the, the dissenters, those who didn't agree with what the church taught, in other words, didn't agree with the Bible, usually left the church. Uh, those who are leaving today many times establish something that resembles the uh, community church movement the community church denomination with more and more of the idea of it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you teach, and so forth. Many times today, the congregations uh, are in, uh, people in the congregation are influencing the elderships to, to move away. Uh, and remember, we're, we're talking about the 1960s, a decade of change. And so I'm trying to bring some of this up to the present time because of the change. Someone asked the other day if, well, wasn't there anything good happening in the church? Then certainly much good is going on. And today, yes, much good is going on. My emphasis, of course, was concerning the changes. And sometimes the dissenters today are, are actually in the eldership. There's a good example, I'm not going to mention what congregation it was, but is, but in uh, North Texas, there's a congregation that I'm acquainted with, and eventually, the one elder who stood for what the Bible said had to leave and the congregation then was uh, totally away from the truth of the gospel. And that is one modern day uh, example of the fulfillment of Acts 20, verses 20 through, 28 through 30. This is the new American Standard Version. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise, 
speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So the present day decline and falling away of many from the Bible teaching had its beginning in subtle ways in the 1960s. And sadly, it was mostly unnoticed by most of us at that time. I'm going to not say nearly as much as I had planned to say. Time has a way of creeping up on us. <clears throat> Thank you. And so I'm going to say several things about uh, the counterculture. There are two or three other subjects that I want to touch on at least briefly before our time is up today. <clears throat> the counterculture was made up mainly of post-war, World War II baby boomers who were affluent. They were raised on Dr. Spock. They were resentful of authority of any kind. It was a period when uh, values began to break down. It was a time when many college students and others became political activists. Primarily, it was a, a time of trying to be different. And I, I think most of us are aware of, of much of this. Many young people just uh, dropped out of, this is a strange way of saying it, they dropped out of society. They didn't want to be like older people. And of course, there's a lot in older people not to like, not to want to be like. But, uh, and I'm, I'm talking generally here, not about any, any specific uh, people. <clears throat> they were at odds with the older generation in uh, many things. I listed a few here. Vietnam War, race relations, women's rights, traditional authority, human sexuality, use of drugs. Um, they, they scorned wealth, but they took advantage in many ways of what wealth provided. <clears throat> um, there were certain forms that emerged during this time, uh, almost a worship of the Beatles, and maybe I ought to throw Elvis Presley in there. Somebody said the other day, are you not going to mention Elvis Presley? Okay, I've done it. <laughs> um, there was a, a less restricted censorship of movies. There was a rise of the hippie lifestyle. And there were several other things that caused uh, changes in U.S. culture. One of the Parts of the new, um, the counterculture was the new left. And this uh, showed itself in, in many different ways. There was uh, the, the free speech movement in uh, University of California at Berkeley. They were against the draft. They, were, they had major demonstrations. They, there, there were lots of uh, things that went on during that time. And, uh, in fact, <clears throat> there were at least 200 major demonstrations in, in the first six months of 1968. In April of 1968, there was one at uh, Columbia University uh, in which the university had planned to tear down some buildings that by the way, black students lived in. I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not. But there was a big protest. Both black and white students uh, protested. And um, one of the protest groups was called the, the Weathermen. Uh, this was the time of uh, the Youth International Party that's sometimes called uh, Yippies. And so anyway, they finally backed down on that and, and uh, uh, they, they didn't uh, build that particular building. 
during the convention of 1968, there was uh, the big uh, protest. I'm going to take a little bit longer on the hippies. The main reason for that is that they have been glorified and magnified and, and glamorized and there are a lot of other eyes to words that could be used uh, for that. <clears throat> but they were primarily middle class white students, but they had no drive for politics. They were among the dropouts. Their identifying features were style of dress that included jeans, uh, tie-dyed shirts, <laughs> when you get yours, uh, well anyway, do with it what you will, uh, sandals, beards, long hair, and the long hair was usually stringy, uh, it looked like it hadn't been shampooed in months and months. They made uh, nonconformity popular. They had the idea and they said, do your own thing. Uh, let's see if I'm missing anything here. I'll, I'll come to that eventually. <clears throat> they practice sexual promiscuity and the use of recreational drugs such as marijuana and LSD. Uh, looking back on it, I, it's, it's hard to imagine LSD being classified as a recreational drug. We had one student at York College who had been on LSD for a while. And I'll not describe his appearance, but we can tell by looking at him uh, that he had been on something. And uh, the, U uh, the USDA warned of the dangers of LSD on April 5th, 1966, and on October the 6th, LSD was banned from the United States. But the drug culture just continued with his. And the drug culture was, was um, reflected in the rock music of Jefferson Airplane. By the way, at that time, I was so busy trying to do something, uh, get ready for classes mainly, uh, that I, I didn't even hear about Jefferson Airplane. I had to find out about them years later. And uh, Grateful Dead. I remember hearing students talk about the Grateful Dead. Uh, had no idea what that was supposed to be. But uh, their rock music um, was uh, well in praise of uh, the drug culture. And uh, as an individual, Janis Joplin, there were a lot of others, but uh, Janis Joplin died on October the 4th, 1970, 27 years old. Overdose of heroin compounded by alcohol. Uh, and, of course, we, we have heard of many, many since that time. The hippies didn't establish communes. You know, there, there were lots of, of uh, dropouts during that time that sort of just all lived together. But that took a lot of energy, and it took planning, and it took hard work. And the hippies were opposed to all of that. Most of them settled in large cities and took advantage of welfare. One of the best cartoons I've ever seen in my life, accompanied by a narrative, is this one. And uh, you may or may not be able to read this, but I'm going to see if I can. Um, and I wish I, could, wish I could say it in the voice that... Uh, you might recognize, but anyway, he's saying to his girlfriend, I'll run over and pick up both our welfare checks, then drop by the university to see what's holding up our federal ed education grants. Meanwhile, you go to the free clinic for a pregnancy test, and if it's positive, fill out the necessary papers for assistance and baby bonus, 
Oh, and pick up my free glasses. And then we'll meet at the federal building at noon for the mass picketing of the stinking establishment. <laughs> <laughs> that should have solved every problem in the world. And what's changed? <laughs> the two best known areas uh, for the hippies to gather was Haight Ashbury in San Francisco. That's uh, where two streets crossed, Haight and Ashbury, um, and the East Village in New York. The best, worst example of uh, of an older hippie was Timothy Leary. He was a psychology professor at the University of California in Berkeley. His motto was tune in, turn no, turn on, tune in, drop out. Um, that's something for a professor to, to advocate. At age 45 in, in 1966, he founded the League for Spiritual Discovery, a religion which had LSD as its holy sacrament. That's what he called it. He tried the freedom of religion argument to justify his use of illegal drugs, but that didn't work. He was arrested many times on drug charges. Um, Well, um, then there's the Woodstock Festival, Cope State, New York, in August 1969. Those who planned it thought there'd be a large crowd, but not nearly the 300 to 400,000 people that showed up. There were no serious problems, mostly drug-related, and medical care was there to take care of all that. The police had decided not to to enforce the drug laws. But, well, let's go back here. Uh, oh, 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 Need to go back? Back. Back. No, there you go. Thank you so much. Whoever. <laughs> <coughs> This is not my kind of an instrument. <laughs> Later, the, the Rolling Stones had a concert in California, but the police were not able to control it. Uh, the Hells Angels were hired to control <laughs> the concert. <laughs> they beat one person to death. Uh, there were several other deaths due to accidents and drug overdose and so forth. Well, anyway, the hippie appearance has been fascinating to a lot of people since the 1960s. And by the way, Tuesday night, I really enjoyed seeing a bunch of hippies. <laughs> uh, I, I thought they, every one of them did such a good job. And somehow I knew that not one of them was a hippie. <laughs> and, and I have absolutely no respect for the hippie movement. And I, and I can't see the fascination that a lot of people have with it. But anyway, there's this um, tin top ways to dress like a hippie. And they said, if you want to dress like a hippie, it's still very cool. And people are still using the word cool these days. So, And in the 1960s, they thought they had invented cool. Uh, in the 1990s, teenagers thought they had invented cool. Uh, these days, teenagers think they have invented cool. Well, way back when I was a teenager, they were saying cool. Do you remember that? That was cool, wasn't it? <coughs> but anyway. Whoa. Again, well, you can leave it there. We'll, we'll, we'll come to him. It's too scary. 
<laughs> finish with this one. I'm going to give you the top ten ways to dress like a hippie. I thought I had it up there, but I guess not. Number ten, flowers in your hair. Oh. They said, guys, you don't have to wear flowers. You can just grow a beard. I think flowers are much prettier than <laughs> Number nine, beads and fringe. Beads around the wrist and neck and attach fringe to clothing and purses and that sort of thing. Number eight, wear colorful clothes, psychedelic, uh, sloppy. Uh, number seven, outlandish jewelry. Number six, wear handmade, a knit, crochet, macrame, so forth. Um, number five, wear sandals, flat that look like they're homemade, or go barefoot with ankle bracelets. Number four, attitude, make love, not war. Peace, man, those were two common, common quotes. Um, number three, Big shoulder bag that looks like a patchwork quilt features any of their emblems. Peace sign, flower, power, free love, that sort of thing. Number two, tie-dye. It was as much the sign of peace as, as you know, they were. Peace man, that sort of thing. And number one, modern hippies call the hippie look Bohemian chic, or cool threads for cool heads. <laughs> anyway, you can get all that in your handout, but not now. Um, Charles Metz. He's the example of the worst that happened during the counterculture movement. He planned to start a race war. Um, he, wanted, he wanted the black people to be blamed for violence. And so he planned a series of violent acts that would make it look like black people had done it so that white people would rise up against them and, and so forth. Um, he was dumber than he looked. <laughs> so, um, on August the 8th, 1969, Manson chose actress Sharon Tate's house, sent four of his family to murder everyone there, make it as gruesome as you can. They were also told to leave a sign so Susan Atkins wrote pig on the front door with Sharon Tate's blood. I'm not going to read over the many things that happened during that time. Uh, it was awful. Some of it uh, you can read about in, in the handout. Uh, the victims are all pictured here. Um, Manson decided to X himself. He said that uh, he was Xing himself out of the establishment. Later on, uh, uh, well, the, the family decided that they would do the same thing, and even though they were not uh, in prison at the time, uh, they, they all put X's on their heads. Uh, eventually, he changed that to a swastika. Bringing it up to the present time, by the way, he was, he was uh, sentenced to death. California changed its uh, law and decided that the death penalty was wrong. And then a year later, they decided that certain forms of the death penalty would be all right. But 
It was not retroactive, so Manson could not be executed. In 2012, the parole board decided that uh, he could be paroled. In 2027, he would be 92 years old by then. In 2014, the California Parole Board said that he had over 100 serious disciplinary violations since he'd been in prison. Um, but he continues to have, as a, a prisoner, a California prisoner told me several years ago about himself, three squares a day, and that was all he was concerned about, apparently, and uh, Manson continues to get that. Susan Atkins was probably the worst, and I think this picture would almost prove it, the worst of his followers. Um, he was quoted as the scariest of the Manson girls. She died on September 24th, 2009 at the age of 61 at brain, with brain cancer in Chowchilla, California, still in prison. <clears throat> the new feminism. Oh, this was advanced more by two things. The pill and abortion. Many, many states passed uh, and legalized abortion. And so this, this was a, a very serious time, I think. Um, well, there were two important milestones in it. First of all, uh, there was the appearance of the book Feminine, The Feminine Mystique. The, the main thing that I want to say about that is that uh, women were admonished to, well, find their own identity. I think that's, that's one quote from the book. Find your own identity. It reminds me of students every once in a while, not very often at York College, but I understand that it took place in a lot of other, but anyway, every once in a while a student would say, I'm, I'm trying to find myself when they're trying to explain why they did certain things that they shouldn't have done. I'm, I'm trying to find myself. Look in the mirror. <laughs> you, you can at least see a reflection. And then, uh, here I am. Well, you can see, you can see what uh, or how I felt about that, that particular uh, thing. And there was another uh, movement uh, National Organization for Women uh, that was started in 1966. It was a time when there was a big push for a new amendment to the Constitution, and they were calling it the Equal Rights Amendment. And every person in the United States, some didn't know it, but every person in the United States already had all the rights that every other person in the United States had. Uh, so that, that was a little bit hard for me to, to uh, understand. Well, that's sort of rushing through this, uh, uh, that period of the counterculture movement. Uh, next, I want us to uh, see a little bit about the space race. <clears throat> Before the 1960s, there had already been a lot of thought about exploring faith, uh, space. Comic books had quite a bit about it. Even though that may not be funny over on the other side, it's still called a comic book. <clears throat> um, in 1957, it looked like the United States was so far behind the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union put this little thing up into space. By the way, a very great accomplishment. Uh, Sputnik. <clears throat> and the United States wondered how in the world, or how in space, 
could the USSR get ahead of us like that? And so they decided that uh, they had to place some blame, and so they said, we have poor science classes in our schools. We have poor math classes in our schools. Poor us, and you can uh, translate the U.S. in two different ways. But it was a time when a change was made in education in the United States. Require more math. Require more science. I'm glad that I was out of high school during that time, out of college during that time. But I, well, I was a math major anyway when I was in high school. So um, it wouldn't have bothered me. That part wouldn't. But science, I would have had a rough time. I'm confessing. <laughs> and then, of course, they, they added a lot of advanced courses. Then the United States launched its first successful satellite in January of 1958. This was 57, the, the Sputnik. And, and so uh, we, we at least had started, but we're still behind. And the, the things that were sent into space were smaller than, than uh, but Project Mercury uh, in 1959, this is just before the 60s, of course, but their uh, program orbit a manned spacecraft around the Earth, investigate the ability of astronauts to function in space. More important, recover astronauts safely, and of course the spacecraft. They started Project Mercury. They they started training seven men for this for this particular program. And then the USSR did it again. Yuri Yuri Gagarin. <laughs> Gagarin. I'm not Russian. <clears throat> He became the first man to orbit the Earth. The United States still behind, still in pain. Um, then on May the 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American in space. He just went up and down. It wasn't a revolution. Uh, it wasn't revolving around the Earth. It just up and down. But that was a, a real accomplishment. Kennedy, on May the 25th, 1961, made uh, a speech before a joint session of Congress. And part of what he said was this. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. A goal for the rest of uh, of the decade. Big goal to reach because we had gone just you know, up, down, and we had a lot more to do than, than that. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief uh, account of the rest of the decade. February 20th, 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. Many improvements were made in launch facilities. On November 20th, 19, or November 29th, 1963, soon after Kennedy's assassination, the Launch Operations Center was renamed John F. Kennedy Space Center in his honor. Um, there, were, there were several other missions that were set up during this particular time, and uh, they were all successful. In 1965, a two-man uh, craft was in orbit for two weeks and made a rendezvous with another uh, spacecraft. The program started spacewalks and dockings. Astronauts were even learning how to troubleshoot in space. In 1966, they knew that they needed a bigger 
more powerful rocket. Uh, I remember at that time, and I don't remember where it appeared, it might have been in the congressional record, but I saw um, an equation which would show how much force was needed in order to put a rocket into space well enough to put one into the moon. I understood the X in that equation. And that's as far as I can go. <clears throat> but they found out in 1966 they needed a lot more and they started developing that. Then everything was coming together for a moonshot and then there was a tragedy. As the first Apollo mission was making plans to fly in February, on January 27, 1967, three astronauts lost their lives in a flash fire. <coughs> Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. This set the program back two years. Two years. Decades almost out. Um, This rocket was uh, sent around the moon. They, they knew that they had the ability to, uh, well, this particular one didn't go around the moon. It just went up uh, enough so that they knew that they could uh, do the job. Um, then on October the 11th, 1968, Apollo 8 astronauts made the first orbit of the moon. Two other missions prove that it was possible to reach the moon and return. December 21st, 1968. Uh, that was the one I just talked about. Okay. This is the thing that many of us saw in uh, July of 1969. Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin. They had an eight-day mission that went 935,000 miles. And there were approximately 530 million people who watched television and heard Armstrong say, one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. That fulfilled President Kennedy's challenge. So we became the leader in the space race before the, the decade was out. I'd like to mention just a few things about the Vietnam War. Um, It's, it's really hard to summarize many years of conflict, many years of disagreement, many years of what was going on uh, during that time. But I would like to, to say a few things uh, about the uh, Vietnam War before, and, and this goes back to World War II, actually before World War II. The French were just like all other nations, most other nations in, in Asia, they had their colonies. And what they called Indochina included Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And they were beginning to have some problems and they really wanted to get out. There was a, a, a battle at uh, Dien Bien Phu. Uh, I can't say that twice. And they decided it was time for them to get out. The only way for them to, to uh, get out was to have a conference and decide how to do it. I, I don't understand that part, but anyway, they, they decided to do that. Uh, Geneva Conference, and uh, it, Vietnam was divided at the, at the 17th parallel. Communists were in the north, others were, I don't notice I didn't say uh, 
of those who believed in democracy. Others were in the South. We went along with the people that were in the South rather than going along with the communists, of course. Why was the decision made in a conference on how the French were to pull out of colonies? Uh, we'll, we'll never under, I'll never understand that. There was a, a leader in, in uh, South Vietnam who was a dictator. We supported the dictator. Uh, we know him as Diem, D-I-E-M. He has more of a name than that, but I can't pronounce it. Um, he became president of South Vietnam, and he eliminated most of his rivals. He was eventually assassinated in 1963, but before that happened, the Viet Cong was established. Viet Cong consisted of communists in South Vietnam that were opposed to the, the uh, government. They started their guerrilla warfare against the government in 1960. We were convinced, I, I'm using the word we as the government of the United States, no matter who was in government at that time, it seems uh, agreed with this. We were convinced that if Vietnam uh, were to fall, that all other nations and areas of Asia would also fall. It was called the domino theory. Uh, and uh, sometimes the government called it the domino effect. And so Kennedy decided that he needed to go along with that movement because we still had uh, 50,000 troops in Korea. Kennedy had failed in the Bay of Pigs invasion. The Berlin Wall went up at the, at the same time. Um, in uh, Cambodia, the Patet Lao was in charge, and that was a communist system. So all of these things made Kennedy decide, we, we have to have some success in Vietnam. In fact, uh, I have a quote here somewhere. <clears throat> Now we have a problem making our power credible, and Vietnam looks like the place. Is that a good read? Well, who cares what I think? In May 1961, Vice President Johnson visited Saigon, and he said that DM, the one pictured over the time, magazine cover. Diem was the Winston Churchill of South Asia. Now he's talking about a, a cruel dictator here. I'm sure that Winston Churchill would not be uh, thrilled about that. And somebody asked him, though, why did you say that? And he said, Diem's the only bar. What do you got out there? Why don't I get a girl then? Oh, no, that's forget that. <clears throat> he promised Diem that we'd send in more aid, and so uh, it started escalating, and it, it got up to um, 16,000 military personnel in there they were supposed to tell the, the Vietnamese how to fight and so forth like that. Um, Eisenhower had had 900 advisors there. The Green Berets were the ones that were sent in. And some of you might remember that a movie was made titled The Green Beret and Everybody's Hero. John Wayne was the star in that one. Oh, by the way, he played a part 
You, how many of you remember The Flying Tigers, the movie, The Flying Tigers? John Wayne, you remember what part he played? Robert L. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was from Macon, Georgia, and he was one of the leaders, one of the two top men in The Flying Tigers uh, at that time. Well, that's different. Forget John Wayne. Um, Bucky Belisles, is that a name that anybody remembers? Uh, our neighbor was the editor of the York Daily News Times, is that what it's called? York News Times. Yep. Anyway, um, Bucky was his son and played with our son, Russell. And they were playing one day, and Bucky had a little thing. And you know how little kids will play. And uh, so after he did this for a while, he was making, making noise while he was flying his little thing around. It was an air, supposedly an airplane. And then he looked over at Russell and he said, this is one of the outdated airplanes we're sending over to Vietnam. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on, actually. I didn't know what was going on in Vietnam. So I decided to make a study and have a, a chapel talk about what in the world is going on in Vietnam. And uh, so anyway, I, I checked to find out. Here are a couple of the outdated airplanes that were sent over to Vietnam for the Vietnamese to use in fighting against the communists who had everything. Um, anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting along that line at, at that time. Uh, oh, there's also, see that updated, <laughs> outdated helicopter uh, also in Vietnam at the time. <clears throat> The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was passed, which stated that the president can take any action, and it was Johnson at the time, any action that he needed to take in order to stop the communists in Vietnam. Now that's, an, that's a wide open invitation to a man to do whatever he wants to do. The, the Gulf of Tonkin um, incident was communist firing on U.S. ships in open water in the, in the Gulf of Tonkin. Later on, it was proved to some, I still wonder one way or the other, but it was proved to some that this was simply a tale that was told, that it really didn't happen. But President Johnson needed all the support he could get to, to send uh, anything and everything that he wanted to uh, to Vietnam. Oh. <laughs> One little thing about guerrilla warfare. Um, It was estimated that in order for us to stay even in fighting against guerrilla warfare, in order to stay even, we would have to have 10 times as many troops as they, as they had. And you can do the math. Yeah. Yeah. And so more and more troops were, were sent in. And, and uh, we, we eventually uh, reached, it seemed like, uh, over half a million troops in uh, Vietnam, and everything seemed to, to reach a stalemate. I have, I have a quote here, and it's not in your, in your handout, but there was a cartoon that appeared during that time. I couldn't find it. I wish I could, but LBJ is on the telephone with an A. This is what we have to do if we're talking about it. <laughs> What's wrong with them Vietnamese? Don't they realize I'm killing them for their own good? 
That was a car too. He didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> he did that. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, let's have a, an intermission. You're, you're wanting to stretch a little bit. Eat goodies, and, and then we'll come back. And I have some interesting things that I want to show you to, to end with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to show you a few things. about electronics in the 1960s. Now, I've already told you that I have been dragged into the 21st century kicking and screaming. <clears throat> it's pretty hard to scream these days with my voice and it's pretty hard to kick with my legs. <laughs> but I'm still at heart kicking and screaming. So, but I remember a lot of the things that happened in the 1960s and I remember years later in teaching uh, high school students about the changes that were taking place. And even though I didn't understand all of those things and they didn't do it, really, we could see just those of us who would use a computer can see that if you have one like mine, for example, it's been out of date for years. And if you have one that you bought last year, you know you're trying to make it up to date. You know, they're all fun. So we're going to just look at some of the things. There were, there were many, many inventions during the 1960s. And in some cases, the dates that I give are debatable. And that really, to me, that really doesn't matter. But in 1960, the halogen lamps were developed. They were manufactured by General Electric. They were patented in 1959, but they started, uh, they were in use in 1960. But they used inventions that dated back uh, about 80 years or so. So uh, this wasn't just a sudden thing that came, just like almost everything else. Also, in 1960, uh, lasers were invented. Albert Einstein, as early as 1917, theorized about the laser. But in 1957, a man by the name of uh, Charles Towns uh, and another invented the maser which used microwaves instead of light. There's an argument about whether or not uh, uh, a guy by the name of Theodore Maiman or Gordon Gould invented the laser, but Gould first used the term. And uh, he failed to apply for a patent until it was too late. And then Bell Labs received the patent in 1960. There have been a lot of lawsuits about this and so forth. I was interested in, in uh, la well, last year, last April, uh, not this past April, a year ago, April, I n noticed a newspaper item. Um, Towns was uh, living at that time in South Carolina, and, and he died in April 2000. 15, at age 99, but he always said, and this, this is the part that was interesting to me, science and religion are compatible. You know, there are a lot of scientists who say just simply because of the fact that they're scientists and I, I can't believe in this and that and, and, and so forth. And they blame it on science rather than blaming it on themselves. But um, he said they were compatible. <coughs> But no matter who invented the, the laser, um, Towns and many others received Nobel Prizes for some phase of the development. 
So this this is something that's very important, I think. Um, every time something good happens, it can be used in a bad way, isn't that right? And we know about lasers being used in bad ways these days. Uh, even airline pilots pilots are are complaining about being uh, shot in the eye from down on the ground somewhere. I, I don't I don't get what. Uh, when when we got some stuff messed up on our computer, Jeanette said, "What good do they get out of it? Uh, they don't know that we have a problem. They can't see our distress or whatever she said." And uh, my reaction to that is that there are some people who simply like to be mean. They don't care who it affects. They know it's going to affect somebody. But anyway, lasers are good. The audio, audio cassette was uh, developed in uh, 1962. First, first developed in France, and then it was uh, introduced in the United States in 64. Also in 62, uh, color telecasting started ABC. Um, three and a half hours a week. Let's see now, my higher math tells me that that's 30 minutes a day. Woo. <laughs> the first series was the Jetsons, started September 23rd. I like that. that I'm, I'm talking about the September 23rd. That's the next birthday. <clears throat> Said that before. <coughs> In 1963, um, the video disc was developed, much larger than today's DVDs, about 12 inches square. The VHS was considered better. <coughs> the DVD uh, stands for Digital Video Disc. They were perfected in 1996. <coughs> Excuse me, you look at that. I must have gotten excited about something. <laughs> Basic. Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. This is a computer language <clears throat> invented by John George Kimeney and Tom Kurtz. <clears throat> this paved the way for many, many more languages. <clears throat> Our son Russell was in uh, computers for years, and uh, he one day he mentioned to me uh, about four or five or six different languages that he had uh, learned, had to learn, and you, you know this symbol. <laughs> The compact disc <clears throat> invented by James T. Russell. It, it was not made uh, available publicly until 1970. <clears throat> but we're all familiar with that. Good news. The handheld calculator, first one in 1967, developed by course, Texas Instruments, and uh, they called it uh, the Caltech. <clears throat> the computer mouse was developed in 1968 by Douglas Engelbart. <clears throat> He called it the mouse because, this is a quote, 
The tail came out at the end. <laughs> The pictures of him holding the original on the underside. The mouse has come a long way since then, hasn't it? <coughs> he, he eventually sold this to Apple Computer for about $40,000. <coughs> the first computer with integrated circuits was made in, the, in, in 1968 also. Um, RAM was developed by Robert Dinner, Random Access Memory. You know how I know all this stuff? Google. <laughs> ARPANET, the first internet, was developed in 1969. See the growth? Isn't that good? <clears throat> uh, what, what was that big uh, TV guy, uh, I mean computer guy's name uh, that Russell worked for? Oh, Ross Pro. Okay. We had, we had the opportunity of, of uh, going in in Dallas going in or Dallas area going into one of the big offices there this is small stuff compared with some of the stuff that we saw large rooms maybe four times the size of this with big stuff in there that was constantly whirring and making noise and so forth all that computer stuff and and now some of you have these little things that, that, that are called smart. <laughs> and, and you can do more on those little smart guys than, than uh, all that big stuff was able to do. But that's not the 1960s. <coughs> barcode bar scanner and barcodes invented in 1969. If we're not for the barcode today, you couldn't buy groceries. <laughs> you couldn't buy anything. The ATM was invented in 1969. At least there were several claims, and I'm not going to go over all that. Uh, it might be interesting to some of you to, to, uh, to see some of the claims that were made and some of the developments that were made and so forth. I have never used an ATM. I never planned to use one. <laughs> uh, my ATM looks like this. Oh, and I have another one at home. I'm so up to date. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I'd like for my last few minutes to, to be used in connection with some fads during the 1960s. Uh, steering knob on steering wheel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and did you know, I don't know about what bus you were in yesterday, but our bus driver didn't need a knob. She could handle that big thing so well, even and the wind was blowing and all that, and, and the bus was hopping here and there, and she just one-handed, even uh, steering off. Uh, <laughs> good. Fender skirts on the automobiles, they covered about half of the, the wheel from the side. Phone booths out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there were a, a lot of um, vacant lots. You drive, you could drive along, and there, here's a vacant lot, and there's a phone booth sitting right out there. Well, you know why, don't you? Convenience. Did you know mailboxes used to be that way? You could find a mailbox way out in the middle of nowhere. Today, if you want to 
be handy, you know, and, and drop into a mailbox. You have to go to the post office and go out, you know, outside. There'll be a very close. They don't want to have to walk very far. No, no. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> you don't find mailboxes all over any mill. Same thing with phone booths. Have any of you been in a phone booth lately? <laughs> okay. Twiggy hairstyles. Short, flat, against the, the bell, I believe. Except <laughs> more hair right here. <clears throat> um, iron one's hair to make it straight. I heard a couple of people talking about that just uh, a day or two ago. It was usually long hair. You don't iron short hair. <clears throat> Women's hot pants and three inch legs. Um, <laughs> let that soak in. <clears throat> Men's paisley shirts. Um, women's bikini swimsuits covered as much or more than today's normal swimsuit. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> called bikini back then. <clears throat> I guess bikini changes from time to time. In fast food places, each booth had its own jukebox. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. You know why I call this a nostalgic look? Yeah. Ten cents would play one song or you want it with a quarter in, you could play three songs. <clears throat> and now, instead of each booth having its own jukebox, each booth has three or four people sitting there with plugs in their ears. <clears throat> Cruising and hanging out. That's when it started. It hasn't stopped yet. It's still, it's still a fad. Uh, some fads last longer than others. <clears throat> Bean bag chairs. Remember those? Today, today, I think, or at least the ones that I have seen, are more decorative. They either say huskers or, or bulldogs. <laughs> that covers two states there. <clears throat> um, beads and doorways and sometimes used as curtains, yeah. macrame plant hangers, calf high go-go boots, and, and uh, the, be they're, the best ones were quiet, you know yeah. that, yeah. had to be quiet. Bell-bottom trousers, I saw a cartoon uh, along about this time. It was pictured on a beach, and here was a, a boy standing there looking at a girl, and he said, this is the first time I've ever seen you without, and I don't know how he put it, but there she was standing, and her ankles were this wide. <laughs> Do you remember in 1968 a woman by the name of Mary Hopkin? Mary Hopkin. Mary Hopkin. She recorded a song. I'm going to sing it for you. Jeanette said, please don't. <laughs> Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> it's been great. I really appreciate the attention that's been given to me. I appreciate this great honor. It's something that uh, a few years ago I never dreamed could ever happen. But uh, anyway, 
thanks to your college. Keep it up, everything that's good, and all of you keep working for the Lord. And uh, someday we'll meet again, maybe. Thank you very much.